Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Welcome to the Harold Davis Studio in Berkeley, California. We are so excited to have you with us today. Today's webinar is Creative LAB Color Essentials. This detailed presentation shows you how LAB Color works and explains its implementation in Photoshop. You'll learn about LAB channels, colors, and inversions, and some of the many things that you can do with this underused uh, color space. Harold is going to demonstrate step-by-step -step examples from his work and show you how you can download and install his Photoshop LAB Action software. Also, Harold will explain how to use LAB for creative sharpening effects by using only the grayscale information in an image, thus avoiding unsightly and over-sharpened color. Harold says, all in all, you get so much in the way of results with Creative LAB than in any other aspect of Photoshop. But at the same time, LAB is surprisingly underused and underrated. I always enjoy teaching this subject and tell my students as the class begins to, to hang on, it's gonna be an exciting ride. Many of you know who Harold is, but if you're joining us for the first time today, here's a bit about Harold. Harold Davis is an artist, photographer, and author. His most recent book is Creative Garden Photography. Harold is the developer of unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency and an innovator of digital, digital multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. Harold is an internationally known photographer. His prints are widely collected and he is a sought after workshop leader. He is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. Harold's website is digitalfieldguide.com. Now I'm going to stop my share and hand it over to Harold. Thanks, Phyllis, very much. It's, I'm, I'm very excited to be with everyone today. And as Phyllis quoted me saying, LAB in Photoshop gives you a huge bang for your buck. It's, it's truly very present in much of my work and something that I would feel impoverished uh, photographically without. I, I am I'm truly excited about it. One of the virtues of a live web, webinar, as opposed to watching a recording, is that you get to ask questions. So I'm going to ask you to please ask questions by putting them in the chat box. If you remember, uh, mark it to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your questions. And Phyllis will gang them up or I'll see them in the chat box and I'll try to uh, answer them as they come up because I, I don't want anyone puzzled by anything here and we're going to cover a lot of ground today. So without further ado or further ado, let me share my screen. What I have partly been uh, debating as I thought about how to approach this was whether to interrupt the presentation to show actual implementations of what I'm talking about, or rather to uh, go through the presentation, hit the presentation end, and then start rolling through examples. I have a lot of fun examples prepared. One thing I have to do to prepare them in the context of a Zoom webinar is to dunk the resolution way, way, way down so we don't spend a lot of time watching a uh, cursor do its round and round thing. Um, so the, the examples take preparation and I've tried to prepare meaningful examples in the key spots of the example. But you know, you may want to know how I got there, why I'm doing it, how I'm doing it, all kinds of things. Don't hesitate. Um, and uh, before I roll on, I see a first question from Denzel. Will I be able to refer to your book on the darkroom for the steps to follow for LAB technique? The answer to that is largely yes. The Photoshop Darkroom, the first book in that series of two books of ours, has a, has a great deal of material and LAB color in it, including some things basically on blending modes that we're not even going to get to today. Um, 
So yes, you will, but bear in mind that was written uh, a while ago. So Photoshop has changed a bit. Some of the things like screen captures won't be entirely accurate, but yes, if you have that book, you can follow along in it. We also in creative garden photography included a chapter on uh, working with LAB color also. So there's that's another book resource you can go to. Finally, there's a really comprehensive class on LinkedIn learning that I did. And this is something that's structured with uh, chapters, uh, cross-referencing, and I think it's got like eight different individual lessons. It's, a, it's uh, hours and hours long, and it's probably the single most comprehensive place to go for this. I will show on my website a link to it. And I think you can get something like a free trial to LinkedIn Learning. So it might even be free. Um, here's uh, Creative Garden Photography, making great photos of flowers, gardens, landscapes, and the beautiful world around us. Creative black and white. And here's a table of contents for some of the things we're going to look at today. Not all of them. Uh, last but not least is downloading, installing, and using the piece of Photoshop software that I wrote for making it easier to do creative stuff with LAB. This is a free uh, Photoshop action, an uh, action being Photoshop's words for a script or macro. Um, but why it's useful doesn't entirely make sense until I show you some other things first. So we're going to we're going to do that the right way. And uh, Carol notes that LinkedIn learning can be accessed for free by most people through public libraries. So uh, that's another way to get to my LAB course. I'm not quite sure what creative destruction is about, but this slide is a image that was pretty thoroughly created using LAB uh, color adjustments and a recent image of a dragon. And here's the LAB L channel inversion of the dragon. So one of the totally cool things about LAB is that you can swap black and white uh, information without impacting the colors, except insofar as they have black or white in. Again, here's the version on white of my New Year's dragon created with flower petals on a light box. And here's the version on black. I like to say that photography is really applied design in many ways within you know, in two dimensions within a frame. This, uh, the, this Photoshop composite here uses both a Bougainvillea uh, bract on a light box, the photograph you see on the left side of the screen, and a LABL channel inversion on the right side of the screen. The terminology LABL channel inversion will become clearer to you as you see the actual examples here. And here's another inversion. This is an image on white that I created to look a lot like an illuminated manuscript image and the L channel LAB inversion. The reason why I say um, LAB L channel inversion, the double barrel technical propeller head term is it's an inversion is an adjustment in Photoshop. You can do an inversion, which is a reversal on any channel or combination of channels you'd like. Um, and an L channel inversion is a specific channel in LAB color. One of the great merits of LAB as a color space, and we're going to get to this more in a bit, is that it separates out the black and white or grayscale information from the color information. So I'm showing you pairs here of images shot on, in, on white and turned to black, or in some cases, vice versa. This is a fairly complex Photoshop composite. The apparent front and back of um, the image that's supposed to be on a paper tacked to a wall is a is the very same uh, light box composition shown here, but with two equalizations of it to create the different color effects that you see. 
And this is somewhat the same kind of thing. It's a Photoshop composite of a Gallardia blossom. And uh, back behind the Gallardia blossom is, a, uh, is an L-channel inversion, I think also combined with an equalization. These things are fun. I mean, that's all I can say, it's fun. And you can, you can get basically an arbitrarily large package of complexity with these things. This is a recent set of tulips. I've been playing with tulips, unfortunately. The last of the tulips just left uh, yesterday, I think, but soon it's going to be spring here and there, there will be more. Uh, you know, I, my joke about the black on white and the white on black stuff is it's a twofer. If I get a photograph on a light box, most of the time I may as well get the inversion also. And if I'm going to photograph on a black cloth, I may as well get the inversion the other way around. This image is something pretty different because it's part x-ray and part light box image and it's an, all an inversion. And another x-ray image. Now here, here we've got an interesting image. I, I created this as a infinitely expandable design. So it's really very, very high resolution. The center of this, is, it, this was done for a publishing client and the, the center of it has been flipped, mirrored and replicated and it could go on forever. And here is a, this is the um, L channel inversion of the image. And this is some kind of combination of uh, various adjustments and equalizations in LAB. Doesn't have to be just flowers. Turn, and you know, when you do something like this, what it most reminds me of is um, like a negative to positive in film photography. Of course, there's nothing to stop you from turning it into a monochromatic image. And it really does look like a negative here. Remember that her skin is uh, like this. It's a you know Caucasian skin. And here we have a pretty simple straight image of an arrow on the sidewalk with shadows coming across it. You can invert the image like this in LAB. You can use another one of the adjustments on it. And eventually I'll show this in living practice when we get to examples you can you can end up with something arbitrarily complex by adding photoshop blending modes to lab adjustments goes on and on and on forever believe me this started as a coca-cola can in a recycling bin in the rain okay you swap uh reds for greens or greens for reds another swap for blues. So originally, uh, I first really learned about LAB back, I think, in 2007, 2008, from a book on it by uh, a pretty wonderful professional retoucher named Dan Margulies. It's not in print anymore, but it's called Photoshop LAB Color, The Canyon Conundrum. The thing is that his book treats LAB color as a mechanism for technical retouching, mostly. Suppose you have a green car you want to turn red. Well, you can do that in about one second in LAB. So I looked at these techniques and I said, how can we use this creatively? And the answer is in many ways, as you'll see. Certain, at a certain point, it becomes an issue of where do you say enough is enough? All right, this is a disgustingly boring uh, diagram, and but important. Um, I, I like to show this in an in-person workshop with a whiteboard and drawing the color spaces in roughly because the important point is not the physics here, but the relative size of the color space. First of all, the size of a color space is referred to as its gamut. So a wide gamut color space has more colors. A small color space is, you know, is 
not a wide gamut color space and has less colors in it. The, the universal lowest common denominator color space is shown in the yellow triangle there and it's srgb it's there's a there's a more fancy name for it we'll see in a little in the uh, photoshop box when you switch to it but it's uh besides being the universal color space for things like uh, monitors and um, and so on it's the crappiest color space known to humanity. It's lowest common denom not denominator, fewest colors. JPEGs that are shown on the web need to be an sRGB. So it's important to understand that if you're going to upload a JPEG to your Instagram, you ought to convert it yourself to sRGB before you do. The general rule of color spaces is you want to stay in as high a gamut color space as long as you can before converting it down. Because once you convert it down, you lose color information. And you once you've lost that color information, you can't get it back. So the workflow is to stay in as high a gamut color space as long as you can, save off a master file at the end, and from that master file, make a duplicate that you dummy down to srgb for posting on the web and if you understood what i just said that's great it's very important it's probably worth the price of admission to this webinar the uh uh if you didn't know it the srgb and cmyk are pretty much comparable color spaces depending on the cmyk but as you can see in this diagram here, there's a bit of a place where they don't overlap. There's some sRGB that isn't in CMYK and some CMYK that isn't in sRGB. CMYK are, is the color space used for reflective art when you lay down ink for a book or for a magazine. So generally there's not much problem converting back and forth between RGB and CMYK, but where there is a problem is where the two spaces are not the same and those gaps where you see the yellow triangle and no red and the other the other way around. Speaking of converting back and forth between color spaces, I should note that the internal color calculations in Photoshop are in done in LAB. So that means you really don't lose anything by going back and forth in into LAB and back to RGB as much as you want. Going forward a bit uh, as uh, 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 in RGB color spaces, Adobe RGB is pretty much a standard color space and it's a decent one. The largest commonly accessible RGB, the widest gamut, therefore largest color space commonly accessible is Profoto RGB. So in, with your software, with Lightroom, Photoshop, Bridge, um, and so on, you should set it to open files from your camera in Profoto RGB. That's, that's the best advice there. Uh, Constance Connie wants to know why isn't CMYK the lowest as opposed to sRGB? Well, frankly, this diagram is, is giving a misimpression there to some extent. Um, the there there are many CMYKs as like just like there are many RGBs. The CMYK you work with is going to depend on the printer specifications. And, you know, when we're designing a book, one of the first things we do is say, "What's your what's what's your what CMYK are you working with?" And how wide gamut that is is really going to depend on the printer. It's possible to very wide gamut C CMYK. CMYK is a general term like RGB. It's not a specific CMYK space. So, so sRGB, and actually, again, it's a longer term with numbers and stuff in it, is, is actually an explicitly a low gamut RGB color space. There are higher and lower gamut CMYKs, and if you could, if you were able and had the time to do a detailed analysis, you could tell where they overlap, where they don't overlap, and uh, you know, generally, if you're going to do a lot of critical reproduction, this kind of thing is something you become expert in. Um, I, I was asked to repeat the part about Profoto RGB. 
of the common color spaces, Profoto RGB is the widest gamut and therefore the best color space to stay in for as long as you can when you're working in color. So therefore, you need to take your imagery into the programs you're going to use to work on it in Profoto RGB. That means setting up your color spaces in Photoshop or in Lightroom or in Bridge or in Adobe Camera Raw, whatever is doing the conversions so that you start out with it in Profoto RGB. That's the way you don't lose any color value in doing, in doing so. And I'll have a look at, at some of what that means in terms of how you set the various dialogue, color management dialogues in Photoshop when, when, we, when we get to the hands-on portion of this webinar. <laughs> My voice survives that long. Yeah, Karen, do you have any follow-up questions on that? It's if I, it'd be a good time for me to clarify anything about color spaces, They're not the not the practical part of it, which we'll get to, but the theoretical part. Okay, great. This is uh, this is roughly speaking a diagram of the implementation of LAB color in Photoshop, um, and it illustrates. Uh, two of the um, two, two of the uh, key principles of uh, LAB, wh why they're so beneficial here, which is not immediately obvious. One is that um, the black and white information, the uh, neutral gray channel is completely separate from the color channels. This is not true of the other color spaces. Um, the other is that the each of the color channels are color opponent. So for example, the A channel goes from green to magenta. Zero in the A channel is neither green nor magenta. Uh, and zero on the L channel, which is for lightness or sometimes called, or you can think of it as the grayscale information is neutral gray. Okay. Come on, you can do it. Why? Okay, LAB color in Photoshop. Well, we just saw a bit of that. Here's another example of running through variations and coming up with something cool. Ah, uh, well, you know, this was done in addition to the compositing, it was done with the LAB inversions and uh, so on. The original images on the upper left, L channel inversion, uh, A channel inversion, B channel inversion, of Bougainvillea bract equalizations. I think I may have shown this one already. Okay, so one of the things we're going to have to do is how to download and install my color action. <laughs> it's a recent image. Here's the version on the light box. Here is the inversion. Another recent image. It's, it's always fun to show recent images in one of these things. You can see I've been having fun. Here's an inversion, and here's the original. And here's how to reach me, mostly. And on that note, I'm going to get started on some examples. Feel free to fire questions as you will. OK. Hey, Harold, there's a question right off the bat. Go ahead. And Dana asks, did you say we should shoot in pro photo RGB? Yeah, uh, no, I didn't. And there's a reason I didn't say that. It's a great question, Dana. Um, if you are shooting in raw, which is what I recommend and which probably most of you do, uh, your, a raw file doesn't have a color space, okay? Most cameras, or many high-end DSLRs or mirrorless 
let you set a have a color space setting and the two choices on it usually are sRGB or Adobe RGB. But all that really controls is the um, the way the display looks. And so in other words, it's creating a JPEG for you to see on your LCD and the color space you pick uh, and uh, is controlled by that setting. So a raw file doesn't have a color space. It doesn't have a color space till you take it in to a conversion program. And that's why I, I suggest um, using Profoto when you take it in. Let, um, and on that note, let me pull up a couple of the uh, Photoshop uh, dialogues here. Um, and color settings. So you want to have your working space set to pro photo and that's that's on the color settings dialog and and using the you can assign a profile and it's pulling it onto my other screen each time which is like that, or you can choose one from the drop down list. And this is the numbers that go with sRGB, IEC 61966-2.1. Now did that add a whole lot? I don't think so. Okay. Let us first, let's first look at the channels on this image. In RGB, you've got a red, a green, and a blue channel. Okay. Yay, Norman, that's what a, what a kind thing, nice thing to say. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so if I'm going to convert this to LAB color, the first thing I do is I, I go edit convert to profile, and then from the destination space, drop down list, I choose LAB color. Note that um, I want to make sure that use black point compensation is checked. The engine I want is Adobe, and the intent is relative color metric. Okay. Um, so now I'm in LAB color. As I'll show you in a minute, the good news is that once you've used that box one time, and let me go back to the box for a second, you can just do a very, very sw flick, switch, quick flip through color spaces. You don't have to go back through the convert to profile dialog. Now, I showed you the channels box before, channels panel. Now it has the three channels like that diagram I showed in the presentation, lightness, A, and B. Um, let's, we're going to do, we're gonna do three things to this image. Um, I just had, saw a question of, will I show again how to do that conversion? Um, I will, let me do it right now. Um, here we are in RGB, you go edit, convert to profile. You make sure that you choose LAB color from the drop down list. You make sure that the engine is Adobe you make sure that the intent is relative color metric and you use black point compensation and you click OK. Going back a second, now that I've done that once and I have the settings right, I can simply go image mode LAB color like that. Okay. 
So you don't have to always go through that dialog box. You just have to do that the very first time. Can you think of anything else that has to be done special the very first time? Well, maybe I can. Um, so, What we're going to do to this image is this was this was like about five hours of star trails in the desert uh, in the Panamint Range near Death Valley and Saline Valley. Um, and we're going to first of all, we're going to add a little bit of color into the sky into the star trails. You know, the, you can see this is pretty much out of the box as it came. But you can you can see their colors. There's some the, the star stars are not neutral in terms of the color temperature of the light they put out. There's some lighter. There's some pink. There's some darker. And in fact, let me look at it up a little close closer. So the first thing we're going to do is put some more color selectively into the sky, and. And we're going to use LAB equalizations to do that. And then I'm going to show you selectively sharpening the um, the star trails. So this is a fair amount of information dump here, and we're going to have we have other examples. So don't, you know, so don't worry. But do uh, do stop me and ask me to do it again if it doesn't if it doesn't make sense to you. So I am already in LAB color here, which is an important point. And um, <laughs> I'm going to duplicate my image. And I'm going to call this one AEQ, short for A equalization. And I'm going to go to my channels palette. I'm going to make sure that the A channel is selected and all channels are visible. Okay. So this this is doing uh, two things. I mean, I think Phyllis will back me up on this. Um, one of the things we get the most questions about from readers are the difference between selecting a channel and making it visible in Photoshop. This is very confusing, really. You have these little thumbnails. If the band is on it, it's selected. If the eyeballs here, it's visible. You want everything visible so you can see the effect of what you're doing, but you only want to operate on the A channel. As you'll remember, the A channel is green to magenta. So it's that's only going to work on the green to magenta stuff. Well, I'm, I've got I've zoomed in way, way far. Note these, by the way, as I said, are resolution adjusted files. So uh, there, it, this is all faster than it may be in real life for you. So to do an equalize, you go image adjustment equalize. And that's only impacting the A channel values that are in your image. So what an equalization adjustment does is it takes what values are there and pulls them out to their absolute maximum. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my A channel adjustment and I'm going to align it back over my star trails. And um, and just paint in a little bit of it, okay? So first of all, I have to make sure that all channels of my LAB adjustment are selected. This is a serious issue because if you don't, you'll be pulling basically a mask over a grayscale kind of thing. And that's another thing we get a fair amount of email about. So you go up here to select all the channels. And now I'm going to copy, copy it over the file. There are a couple of different ways to do that. Right now, I'll show you select all, edit, copy. And then I go to my target, and I go edit, paste. OK, everyone see how pink that is? 
and I'm going to actually just get rid of this one so that it isn't confusing us. And so I'm going to call this A EQ. I do suggest you name your layers to avoid confusion and uh, delay of various kinds. And let's, here's the original, here's the A adjustment. Uh, let me again zoom in on this a bit. There's the A adjustment. Now you can see why this is a powerful effect, but you wouldn't want to ever use it probably at 100%. You always want to dial it down. So the way you dial it down is you put a hide all layer mask on it like this. You take a brush tool and you put it at a percentage opacity. I have my flow at 50%, which controls how fast the brush comes out and my opacity at about a quarter, 26%. And that, that uh, says, okay, it's a quarter strain. So here I am, I'm painting in some strips of red basically where I see the pink on this thing. And let's have a look at, let's have a look at this up close and see if it's enough. Here's the, here's the mask I just painted. Um, and and um, I think for exaggeration, I'm going to have to paint it in a little more so we can really see it. I could see that, but I don't know if you could. Let's paint some in at uh, 80% and at uh, bigger. Okay, that you can really see. Let's just do a bit of that. It's a little you know, my point is that it's easy with LAB to get garish. And since we're such kind people, we don't want to get garish. Uh, okay. Anyone who can't see that, well, I, you know, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Um, the I am going to now do the same thing for the B channel. It shows I should not have closed the other copy of it, but we, we always have a workaround. Uh, so I'm going to go image, duplicate, and we'll call this B EQ. This is for the yellow that we're really going to be working on here. And I'm going to delete that layer we just made. Okay. So I've got the B channel selected like this. And I'm going to go image adjustment equalize. Okay. You see how the got all these yellows now in here. Here's before the equalization, here's after the equalization. So once again, I have to make sure in the channels panel that I have all three channels selected. I'm going to copy it over. This time I use the move tool, I hold down the shift key and I go bump like that. I let go of the mouse before I let go of the shift key. That's another way to copy it across. In the layers panel, I'm going to call this B e equalization. And I'm going to put a layer, layer mask, hide all onto it. And then again, I'm going to take my brush for the sake of exaggeration. I'll put it up at 50% and I'm going to put a little bit of nice yellow into here. We got really colorful starlight that night. That long, oops, that one didn't look too good. Let me get rid of it. That long night out there. Let's, so if you look at this, you can see what my equalization did pretty easily. 
Okay, any questions about this so far? Oh, I'm waiting for uh, somebody to type something. I don't see anything at the moment, Harold. All right, let's go on and do some selective sharpening in this. So a quest, a thought, a thought experiment for you. When, you, when people look at a photograph, where does their eye go first? Okay, answer. Their eye goes to bright colors. Where does the eye go second to sharp areas? So what if you can control sharpness selectively? Oh, you can control where the order at which people look through your photographs. This is really very important. Um, so let me, let me layer this down in a normal course of a workflow. I'd want to encourage people to archive images before they layer them down. Archive is a fancy name for save a copy because that way you can get back to where you are. But I, I, I'm going to ignore that. I layer it down and the, the name of this game is sharpening the black and white information only because where sharpening begins to look dreadful in some cases is when color pixels are sharpened. Black and white pixels can be sharpened quite a bit, bit and it won't degrade color. So let's go have a look at some of this material here and I'm going to duplicate my layer and that's so I can do it selectively. I'm going to go into my channels panel and I'm going to make sure only the lightness um, uh, channel is selected. I'm going to make all channels visible. And then I'm going to take a simple uh, un uh, sharpening filter, the unsharpened mask, and you can see the rather intense sharpening that that does. Um, but it's really not unattractive. Let's take it down a bit. Um, you could start with, if you're using LAB color, you could start with settings about like what are shown here with a threshold at eight, a radius of about 11, and normally uh, amount between 50 and 100%. If you're not using LAB color, if you're using some other uh, more general sharpening, you don't want numbers that are this high. So let's do it at oh, seven, 80%. Okay, like that. So backing away a bit, you here, here it is with the sharpening. Here it is without on off. Now, just because I have sharpened it that much doesn't mean I have to keep it that much. I can turn down the opacity. Uh, let's, let's label this sharp, sharpening. And I can turn down the opacity here if I want. So that's only 42% of the effect. Oops, where's the my two? There we go, 42% of the effect. Or I could leave it at 100% put a layer mask on, go hide all, and then put on a gradient tool. And the idea is I don't really want to sharpen the foreground, but I do want to sharpen the sky. So I can put a mask like that. And here's what my mask looks like. And I put the opacity down about, again about halfway. So. So there you go. This is a way to make these star trails look like they're this infinite round sharpening thing in the sky. And of course, as you get more complicated and more subtle with this sharpening and masking technique, you can do rings of sharpening that roll into the image itself. And um, Holy moly is right. This is a very, very, very powerful technique and very simple to implement. Are there questions about this before I move on to another example? Hey, Harold, Denzel has a question. Is it there a possibility that you could make an algorithm? Well, uh, my algorithm days are gone, but I leave those to Al Gore. No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
No, but the the Photoshop darkroom book and Creative Garden Photography both have this kind of material in fairly step by step fashion, as does the LinkedIn Learning. Um, uh, and the point of the software that I'm providing is really to do a lot of the grunt work for you, but you don't understand what the grunt work is doing until you until until you see some examples of it. So that's why I haven't led off with the software, but I'll get there. I promise. Um, yeah, but you know, you do this a few times. It's really not hard. And if you run into trouble, uh, um, you, you can certainly send uh, Phyllis or myself an email. Just, uh, just remember to convert into LAB before you try doing any of these things. They're, they're absolutely useless in RGB or CMYK. And you think I'm joking, but uh, Phyllis, will you attest that we have a few emails that really start off that way? Oh, absolutely. And sometimes when I'm feeling like a noodle head, <clears throat> I do it by accident too. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, oh yeah. Uh, this is a good one to start with. Um, do, I, do I have a start here? Yes, I do. Okay. Got a nice uh, RGB here image here. Let me duplicate it. Image, duplicate. Let me put the duplicate into LAB, image mode LAB. And now let me do an L channel inversion on it. image adjustment invert okay um a couple of things one i tend to talk out the menu choices i make but note that when you're doing it yourself they're almost always keyboard shortcuts i don't show those because you won't see them where you are and i like to show what i'm doing but but there are okay now, let me back up and show an, an, an all three channel inversion, okay? Image adjustment invert. You know, what I really better do is show the two side by side. So the point here is that an LAB channel inversion is different from an L channel inversion. So I'm going to go back to my original image, duplicate. I'm going to minimize this to get it out of the way. And I'm going to go into LAB color. And I'm going to select the L channel, make sure all channels are visible and we go image adjustment invert, okay? So you've got two different, um, what's the word? Two different brands of fish here. This is an LAB all channel inversion. And this is a LAB L channel inversion. The L channel inversion swaps blacks for white. The LAB channel inversion swaps all information. Um, now let's go back and do a A channel inversion. What do you think is going to happen? Think about it. Image, well, let's, let's duplicate it first. Image mode while I'm, while I'm, uh, converting it. Somebody want to call out what they think is going to happen with an A-channel inversion? Image, adjustment. Dana, 
Hey, Harold, Dana says green to magenta. Well, yeah. <laughs> so far, so good. Uh, Dana, since you're so uh, so good at this, how about uh, uh, the B channel inversion? What's going to happen? Uh oh, she's on the hot totally. spot now. <laughs> no, not at all. Up, oh, blue to yellow. <laughs> Indeed. Good job, Dana. Image duplicate. And we're going to invert the B channel. Okay, so got a bunch of uh, this is a B channel inversion. This is an A channel inversion. If I remember correctly, what order I did in them in this is a it shows the importance of labeling and this is an LAB inversion and this is a L channel inversion. All right, let's do a few equalizations. Um, image, duplicate. Okay, so I'm just going to equalize all three channels. Image, adjustment, equalize. So remember that what I said was, oops, I hate it when it does that, um, that equalization takes takes whatever the color it is to the maximum. Well, LAB will do that. Uh, an LAB equalization will do that with the grayscale information. So it takes it to the maximum. As it turns out, an L channel equalization and an LAB equalization do the same thing, which is not often I can say that. And let me do an A channel equalization, which does something pretty different. Image, duplicate. There's a point to all this, we're getting there. Um, image, adjustment, equalize. Okay. And let's do a B channel equalization. Image, duplicate. image adjustment equalize. All right, that's a lot of color from one fairly uh, fairly monotonic uh, image. Here's the original image. Here's a B channel equalization and a channel equalization. A um, that was I think a uh, LAB equalization, so on and so forth. No, not that. All right, questions about this so far? Okay, it is now time to um, to uh, run the uh, run run the macro on this stuff and show you what that's all about. So file, close all. Let's all close all and let's not save anything for simplicity's sake. And now I'm gonna reopen this thing, okay? I'm gonna make myself a duplicate, image duplicate. And one of the things to keep in mind, again, it's another source of, uh, source of emails is to convert to LAB before you run the action. If you don't, it will uh, blow up, which is a polite software way of saying it will stop working. Um, and I will show where to find the action and how to install it in a minute. Image adjustment, uh, well, first image mode LAB. This is, and we're working on a duplicate here. On my actions, panel, which I'm going to put to button mode, I have lab action by Harold Davis, which I'm about to click to run. Okay, 
So if you look at um, what this did is it walked through the the adjustments that I made, the equalizations and the inversions. Actually, there are a few more here than we did. There's an AB equalization, a B equalization, an A equalization, an L equalization, an AB inversion, which that looks like a pretty close to the L equalization. Sometimes you find that, that some of the moves are very comparable. An A inversion, an L inversion, and the LAB inversion. The idea here is to create a palette of possibilities. So you can see what the immediate possibilities are. You don't have to go through the steps of generating them yourself, which are to pick a channel or channels, pick an adjustment, and then make sure all the channels are adjusted again. It's all set up for you, ready to use. Now, how how might you um, how how might you actually use them? Well, let's go back to our original image and note that this image is an RGB which is important because there are more, <clears throat> more blending modes in RGB than you have in LAB color. And let me take um, an AB equalization. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna flip my image um, horizontally like that. So it's opposite. And now I'm going to pull it over the original image like this and I'm going to cycle through possible blending mode to see what I get. Okay, we begin to get something like a sort of scotch tartan. And there's a difference blending mode. It's a checkerboard pattern. There's divide. Oh, let's leave it at divide. That's kind of fun. Um, and let me do, let me just, just to let this sink in a little more, let me do one more. I'm gonna take, oh, uh, this A equalization looks like fun. Let me flip it vertically, image, adjust uh, rotation, flip vertically, and I'm gonna pull it over and like that, and then let me run through what some of the possibilities are. Multiply, that isn't so exciting. Um, overlay, it usually produces something pretty cool. Difference, oh, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm not so excited about that. Exclusion, I mean, I, I got someone once saying to me with disappointment in one of the workshops, you mean I have to cycle through all those blending modes? There's no way to know in advance what they do. Well, after a while, you begin to get a bit of a feeling for what they're likely to do. But the reality is there's no, no good way to know what this stuff does till you start trying it, really. So make this a little bigger. And that pretty much gives you the idea. OK, let's go into the topic before I run through more examples. Um, hey, Lane, a great question. Do you convert to RBG before you move? Um, and I'm about to get to explain how to install the action. Um, so yes, if, if, well, you don't have to convert. Okay, so look, um, Here's, here's back at the original image. So the image here is an RGB. When you drag a layer over it, the layer you drag over converts to the underlying color space. So you don't act, have to explicitly convert it to RGB before you, uh, before you pull it over. Um, you should be aware that you don't want to convert a multi-layer document from one color space to the other. In fact, if you try, you'll get a, one of Photoshop's sort of namby-pamby error message. For example, if I try to put it back into LAB, 
as a multi-layer document like this, I will get an error message that says, changing modes can affect the appearance of layers, flatten the Im image before layer mode. And that's correct. If you are going to be switching back and forth, you want to do it with a flat document. But the further answer to the question is that by pulling something over something that's already in RGB, it, will, it gets converted automatically. Um, Sarah, you, that makes sense to you? If not, please let me know and I'll try to clarify. Um, okay, let, let me pull up um, a web browser and make this a little bigger. And our website is, I think we've mentioned, um, oops, yeah. digitalfieldguide.com. If you just type Harold Davis into Google, you'll find it quickly enough. And I, w I do want to note that the uh, LinkedIn learning classes can be found here on the on the website too, with along with a annoying uh, GIF. Um, over on my about menu in interviews, profiles, and links, down toward the bottom is uh, the download for the current version of the LAB action. And there's a README file which has information about how to install it and a click that you can download the link. The important point with the action is to put it someplace where you know where you're going to be able to find it. Okay. So I'm going to put it in, uh, doesn't really matter, downloads. Well, I've already done it, Harold's lab action. Okay. Um, Let's let's uh, let's do a new one so that you can see this right. New folder. Um, Harold's action today. <laughs> okay, create download. This works slightly differently on um on on uh, mac and windows but you should be able to figure it out so i unzip it okay and again there's a readme file in here and there's a dot atn file now we're keeping in mind the location that you unzipped it to you go back into photoshop and you go, you go to the actions panel, you open the actions panel on Windows actions like this. It's got a keystroke too. To upload the action file, you want to make sure you're, oper you're not operating in button mode. That's controlled with the little menu you see on the upper right of the actions panel here. So you uncheck button mode. And the next thing you do is you go back here and you go load action. Okay, it's on this menu under button mode. You go find where you put it and we downloads Harold's action today, action, and you highlight the file. And since I already have it installed and I really don't want two copies sitting here gumming up my works, um, I, I'm not going to click open here, but then you click open and that's all there is to it. Okay. Um, the other thing I'd note is that when you actually want to use the action here, I think it's easier to go back into button mode and you'll find something like this lab action by Harold Davis there. Are any questions about installing the lab action? How do you delete one if you have an extra? I think there's a, uh, I think there's a delete on this thing too, for sure. Um, basically, you highlight it and 
drag you you hi, you highlight it in the non button mode like uh good grief it's what a long action that is um and you drag it to the trash can here and also harold we have a question from dana what is button button mode, mode toggles in the action panel between something where you can see the actual instructions like you're seeing right now on the action panel and something that makes it a little more user friendly with um, with these buttons that you can click so that you can color code them and click them so that you don't have to be looking at naked uh, computer code. And also to um, if you can't see the action panel on Photoshop when you open up, just uh, go to the Windows menu up there and you can select window. It. Actions. There. And there's actions. Yeah, it's got a keyboard thing. I'm never sure what this first thing is, but it's a dingus. It's a dingus F9. Okay. I mean, really uh, running, installing, running, and um, and so on. My lab action should not be should not be very hard, provided you remember to switch your image into LAB before you try running it. If you don't and it stops working and gives you a blinking red light, the best thing to do is make sure everything's saved and then close down Photoshop and reopen Photoshop. Uh, questions about this? Good, good, good. Let's move on to another example. Phyllis, how are we doing in terms of time? I'd certainly like to run through some more examples. Well, it's a quarter after 12 for us. So I guess we've been at this about, I don't know, an hour or so. Okay. We'll see how long we can keep them going or if they start, you know, drop them because it's like drinking from a fire hose, right? Harold? <laughs> there you go. I tried to note where I should start on these things. Okay, this is a simple one, uh, simple one, but not possible to photograph today for several reasons. The decorative doors of Notre Dame. Um, now we're certainly not rushing it. Image mode, LAB color. And what I'm gonna do here is just invert it. Invert the L channel, image adjustment invert okay so that produces an interesting image and this kind of thing is fun to do with like lace or filigree or iron work because it um it produces an interesting effect you know and you have to remember to reselect all channels what i'm going to do for the pure bloody heck of it since i'm here is um run my lab action on it Oh, it, it's a monochromatic image. It doesn't like the equalization commands, which uh, which call on color. Okay, yeah, that was not very successful. Okay, let's close it down and try running it on a color version. So, th this there's an interesting moral here, and that is that you cannot you cannot run many of the LAB. Uh, adjustments on a black and white image. You can only run L channel uh, actions on on a, um, and I had better shut my Photoshop and I can reopen it in a minute. So let's pull up this version, which certainly looks to be in color. And it's already nicely inverted for us. I wonder why. Okay, make it a little smaller. I'm going to take down the bit depth just so that we don't have to um, sit forever watching it. And let's see how big it is. Image size. Oh, that's all on you. Okay. Oh, 
obviously this has already been uh, played with. It's already an inversion, but it's not in monochrome. So I am now going to run my lab action on it. Uh, okay, like that. Oh, you know, I just made the classic blunder, and that is that I forgot to convert to LAB first. Okay, so it's going to give me grief till I do. Stop. Okay. I'm going to have to start over here. Okay, so we got some pretty funky things here. Look at that one. A B equalization, B equalization, A equalization, L equalization, A B, and so on. And if you wanted to uh, do some of the other kinds of things I was showing you with the arrow, you could put this into RGB. You could take, let's say, the A equalization. You could flip the A equalization horizontally. You could pull it across like that and put the two into, um, you could try overlay. Well, no, that's not too exciting. How about difference? It's beginning to be pretty psychedelic there. So you get all kinds of possibilities in your palette of possibilities here. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull up, I'll pull up a light box image. Uh, a lot of fun. And, and useful. I mean, the general rule with this stuff is that unless you want to come up with something really psychedelic, you don't want to use it at full strength, but that doesn't, and in fact, let, so let me show you some of those too, where it's actually applied in, a, in, in real life. Um, okay, let's see, what should we do next? Um, oh, okay, let's do my dragon next. And then I'll do a, a couple of practical ones. Hi, Larry. Uh, the Larry's question is, I still don't get what's happening when you equalize. Um, and Connie wants to know, will you also be able to show how to replace one color with another? Well, you know, uh, th there are two ways to look at the one replacing one color with another. If you if you if you have a solid block of color and you want to replace, well, you just uh, take the color channel that it's in and uh, invert it, and that that will replace it down the line. But if you really want to replace, that involves a, a custom color, so to speak. That involves selection as well as color manipulation. So here you have a light box image, and. What's happening when you equalize from a theoretical point of view is it's taking the color values in a given channel and it's maximizing them. So if you're doing it on the A channel, it's taking all the green that's there and making it as most green as possible and all the magenta that's there and making it as most magenta as possible. But the reality is with this stuff that some of it is beyond human comprehension to really understand the theory without seeing it. So you really have to play with it a bit and you begin to get the concept. I mean, in fact, LAB color itself is mind bending in that way, the sense that you can specify colors using the LAB coordinates that have no corresponding reality in, uh, in, in, in nature, in our perception or in any ability to reproduce it. So, We've got here my New Year's dragon on white, I think a fairly 
close to the end version. And what I'm going to do here is duplicate this image. It's always a good thing to do. Image duplicate like that. And I'm going to minimize this one. And then I'm going to put this into LAB image mode LAB color. And then I'm going to run the macro. So making this a little bit smaller for now, or a lot smaller. We've got some interesting palette of possibilities. I sometimes think of this as the Andy Warhol effects. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, here's an AB equalization, which has taken most, it turns out that's mostly magenta. Here's a B equalization, which is maximizing yellows and blues. Here's an A equalization. Here's an L equalization, which as you remember is the same thing as an LAB equalization. And what that is doing is maximizing whites and grays. So see, it's turned it gray. Here's an AB inversion, which makes my poor dragon basically turquoise. Here's a B inversion, which makes my dragon basically purple. Here's an A inversion, which makes my dragon basically green. And here are the two uh, ones that convert the back color to black. Now there is a bit of a problem with the L inversion, which has turned the dragon to black. And that is, as you can see, besides turning the background to black, the dragon itself is a bit dark. So uh, incidentally, you could reach this spot without running my macro, of course, which is by just uh, making a duplicate, making sure the duplicates in LAB, selecting the L channel, uh, making sure all channels are visible and going image adjustment invert and then making sure all channels are selected before you try and do anything with it. So what do you do with a dragon that's too dark on a black background? Well, what you do is this. You duplicate the layer, layer, duplicate layer, and then you apply a curve adjustment to the um, to the background, so in LAB, so you're just operating on the lightness channel here. As um, my uh, friend Stephen Christensen, who will be doing a night photography webinar with me coming up at the beginning of April, uh, said to me once when he was doing things, he said, well, what I've learned is that any adjustment you can do, you can do with a curve. So why bother with anything else? And it's just about right. So what you want to do here is you want to pull the dragon out using the curve dialog like that. Okay. And generally, it's not a bad idea to go a little too far. And I go, okay. And I'm going to put a layer mask, hide all on top of it. And now with a partially opaque brush, 50%, I'm going to start. Okay. Yeah, 50% isn't bad. I'm going to start painting in my dragon on the black background. Obviously, in real life, you do this with a fair amount of care. And you can vary both the size of the brush you use and the opacity with which you paint. And, but uh, basically that's how to selectively bring back portions of an inverted image that have gone too dark. You apply a curve adjustment to a, to a layer and paint in the parts you want, leaving the rest untouched. And here's what the, um, the mask I just created looks like. Funny, it looks a little bit like the dragon itself, right? Any questions about this so far? No, good, because this is very, uh, 
very good stuff, cool stuff. I love it. So let me take this one step further. I'm going to go uh, layer, flatten image. I'm going to put it back into RGB. So I've got my full panoply of layer modes. And let me go find one that's pretty cool. Oh, let's find the AB equalization uh, somewhere under here. Yeah. Hey, Harold, Lane has a question. I, I, I just moved this into RGB, Lane. There you go. Answer, she asked, uh, are you still in LAB? I just moved it into LAB, into, into RGB, because I get my full panoply of, um, of I get my full panoply of uh, blending modes in, uh, in, in RGB, and I don't in LAB. Oh, when I did the curve, yes, I was in LAB, and that's important. It was a, I was in LAB, and I was only operating on the lightness channel. Yeah, there's actually a drop-down box in the yep. curves um, dialog correct. that will let you select which channel you want to operate on. And Harold had lightness selected. I'm, I'll try to see. I'm sure I have another uh, on white in my examples box, and I'll try to do another one. Um, uh, before before we're through, because that's an important point, and I did go go through it pretty quickly. Okay, so here this is, and let's see what a what uh, I moved the image back to RGB after I layered it down after applying the uh, curve adjustment. And you go image mode RGB is the way to get it back. So what I'm going to do here is paint in selectively some of the AB adjustment layer, layer mask, hide all. And let's make this a bigger brush. Think about that. See how the dragon is coming to life, right, Phyllis? Rawr. OK. <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, okay, let's close down this one. Close all. Don't save. Oh, I should apply it. Okay. okay. There's. Um, let's do. Let's do uh, this. Nice model here, and you can see that she's an RGB. So let me switch her over to LAB. image mode LAB and shall I tell you what let me back up for a second let me duplicate her first image duplicate this is more on the on the on the practical end of things than uh, than the image mode LAB and I will run my action on her. What we're really going to be interested in here are the uh, are the A and B equalizations. Okay, so I'm going to shut A B equalization because oh, uh, over on the other screen, are you? Because I don't care about it. And. Let me copy the B equalization over the image like that. Now, admittedly, that's not beautiful so far, but what we're going to do is first of all put it in color blending mode. This is a BEQ. And I'm going to put a layer mask on. 
hide all. Now let's put a bit of nice color in her, in her hair. Okay, see that? Now let me make her eyes a little bluer. Okay, that's too much. Water looking, yeah, it's still too much. So this is powerful stuff like that. Oh, that's pretty good. She, she's got one blue contact and one new blue. It's funny when you do work on a model's eyes, you can tell whether they were wearing contacts or not. You see the line. Okay. And let me, let me uh, paint her lips a little too. So I will use this A equalization for painting her lips. Oh, it wouldn't hurt to put a little red in her hair too. Layer, well, let's see, let's put it into color blending mode also. I'm still in LAB color, by the way. Layer, because I don't need any fancy, I don't need no fancy blending modes here. Hide all, let's, yeah, it's about right. 13% for the hair, don't want to overdo it. Yeah, kind of cool, okay. Now for the lips. You want to be careful with lips that you don't overdo the shape that the lips are actually in. And I'm gonna to want to move my brush a bit harder too. So it's the boundary issue. That should do it and let's Paint it in about like that. Nope, too much. Let's say maybe half that. Yeah, that's cool. Again, in real life, you can take as much time on something like this as you actually want. It's applying, it's applying lipstick ex post facto. And you know, the number of times I found myself doing this kind of thing to teeth and lips is amazing. Okay. And also if you find it's too much, you can always take down the opacity of the layer, right, Harold? Uh, Phyllis, a very, very good point. Now I did something that is a little uh, antithetical to that uh, great idea, which is that I did two things on this one layer. I did her hair a little bit and her lips now, you know, let's look at the lips more closely. So really you should do each adjustment on a separate layer. That way you have later control about taking it down. If I thought her lips were too much here, I just take down the overall opacity of the layer like that. Um, and that's, that's e real easy to do if that's the only thing on the layer are the, is the adjustment to her lips. I'm gonna do one more thing here before I, call it a wrap with Kirsten. And that is I'm going to pull over the L equalization like this. And I'm going to put the L equalization into soft light blending mode like that. And I'm gonna put that at about uh, 10%. So I'm going to say with very few exceptions, 90% of the time, almost every image is gonna be improved, whether it's a landscape or a portrait or whatever it is, almost any image is gonna be improved by an L equals equalization in soft light blending mode at between eight and 10%. It will increase contrast nicely. All right. Shall we say goodbye to Kirsten? I take it that's sort of a yes, sadly. Um, let's see.
this one was fun as a exercise because I photographed the succulent on black. That's a black velvet cloth draped around the container it's in. And so you can certainly adjust the L channel um, starting with on black as well as on white. So to do that, I would go image mode LAB like that and image adjust invert. See, I don't need no stinking macro and make sure to reselect all the channels. Kind of cool. And then with this image, what well, I actually ended up presenting it in black and white in monochrome. Soft light blending mode at eight to 10% layer opacity. Adds, adds contrast nicely. All right, let's, um, <laughs> All right, let's 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 do this one. I'm gonna convert it to LAB. going to run my macro on it. I'm going to take my Andy Warhol pairs. Here's the famous L equalization here. A, B inversion, B inversion, A inversion. Of course, you know, you can generate all of these uh, as manually as much as you like. Um, so here's the L inversion. And this time I will take it a little more slowly when I apply a curve to it. Uh, once again, Many, but not all of the flowers, stems, things like that have gone too dark here. So we want to be able to selectively lift out parts of it. Layer, duplicate layer. And then image adjustment curves. As Phyllis pointed out, the curves dialog uh, has a drop down list and I've selected the lightness channel and fundamentally to lift everything um, catholically with a small C, what you really want to do is just pull the top of the curve over to the left and that does it. You know, th there can be cases as again, to paraphrase uh, my friend Stephen, you can do anything with a, with a curve, but, and you can create complex curves, but there's no real need here. Just go something like that. Okay, so any questions about the curve dialogue here? It's, I find it much easier to work with a more detailed grid that's controlled by the grid size. Uh, uh, Harold, Jocelyn has a question. Uh -huh. Harold, when you create the flower transparencies in a light box, do you cut the flower heads from the stems and place them one by one on the light box so that the heads are placed exactly and facing the way you want? Often, sometimes. And Norman also has a question. I experiment with some infrared. Any thoughts about what you can do with infrared using the LAB conversions? Um, I have combined the two. And I think I think I think there are some great possibilities there, but um, uh, it's sort of it, it's 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 a field that's wide open, and I'd love to see what you come up with. But uh, if you're talking about colored infrared, yes, I think there's some way they're going to go very nicely together. But you you really have to look at what the blending modes you use are, and so on. Well, I, I would suggest Jocelyn for more about the light box you look at either some of the recordings uh, that we have, particularly there's one that focuses on composition and arrangement, which is really what your question 
uh, goes to. Or we do have another uh, webinar coming up. When, when is it? Do you have any idea, Phyllis? February 27th. Uh, so it's a second one on composition on the light box. Oh, and uh, Harold, when you close your curve style out there, could you pull your uh, layers and channels panel box down a little bit so that it's not hidden by the partially hidden by the actions panel? Sure. Thanks. Better? Oh, much better. Thank you very much. So Hi, Jane. Actually, it works the other way around. You choose the blending mode after you put the one on top of the other. Because it defaults to normal when you drag a layer over the other. You have no real choice about it. Uh, and you know the, the sort of broader question there is, how much do I know before I pick a blending mode, uh, which one's going to work? And the real answer, uh, disappointingly, is I don't know as much as I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's they're, they're always surprises doing this stuff, which I think is part of its both uh, pleasure and pain. And it's kind of fun to cycle through all of them and see what they're doing. That's right. There's there's a fair amount of serendipity uh, here. But I, I think, as you just said, Jane, and I love serendipity. The the the. The other side of that is that it's easy to go too far. And that's part of why it's important to archive your work as you go along in case you decide, well, you know, really it was nice 12 adjustments ago, but now all I'm getting is pea soup. It can happen, it's happened to me. <laughs> okay, let me put a layer mask on top of here. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to, I'm going to leave the red alone, but I am going to paint in, um, paint in the darker stuff, for sure. That's about right, and we'll do it at. We'll see how a fifty percent goes. Yeah, that's about right. Everyone see that? Lifting out the dark corners of life. Um, hi, Karm. Will could you please elaborate on what your question is? Will I be highlighting sharpening? I, I it's not something I was planning to present much more on today. I was wondering, Harold, would you um, sharpen the centers of the flowers? Perhaps I don't know. It's just a question. It's a possibility. Um, Probably, if I was going to do that, I would have done it before now in the workflow. You know, typically, what I do in my uh, in my workflow is I get to a fine version on white or a version I, I like on white before I duplicate and move over into LAB and do the black background stuff. But you know, you could, and um, there are there's so many things you can do. I guess you could have, when you had uh, the model Kirsten up, you could selectively sharpen her. That eyes. would be a good idea, of course, if you don't overdo it. So here, what I would do now that I, well, first of all, let's let's look and see the difference. Okay. And here's the uh, layer mask I created, basically just the dark spots. So I, I still find some of it too dark, but I'm going to fix it in a different way. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to layer it down because you're supposed to do that before you convert between color spaces. If you don't, Photoshop will tell you what a naughty person you've been. Um, Carm, I demoed it with the uh, Star Circle app. Uh, um, um, example yeah near the beginning near the beginning and, and we record everything so we will be getting this up on youtube so for anybody you can watch this again and and just go through the steps and see what's going on because i know sometimes things go by very quickly so i'm so um i'm, I'm happy though to um just for the heck of it quickly show it again here 
me in a minute. Uh, as Phyllis said, it's always reasonable to uh, sharpen the center of things like flowers or people's eyes or things like that. So yeah, sure, why not? Why don't I show it? But before I get there, um, so I'm going to go back to my LAB color palette and pick the image and pick the LAB inversion image, the full inversion, not the L channel inversion, bring it back over and I'm going to put it in exclusion blending mode. And you can see that lightens everything up with a kind of pinkish inner glow can be counted on to do that. So again, the formula was the LAB inversion using exclusion blending mode over, uh, over a black image. Layer mask, hide all. And then I take my brush and I paint it in a bit. And then let me turn up the opacity so we can really see it. Does take down the saturation too a bit, which might be good, might be bad. Just to just to uh, reiterate the uh, thanks, Phyllis. Just to reiterate the uh, sharpening business again, let me layer this down, flatten image, Im move it into LAB color, layer, duplicate layer, call the duplicate sharpen. Make sure in the channels panel that only the lightness channel, the black and white information is selected like that, all channels visible, then go filter, sharpen, unsharpen mask, and it's kind of over sharpened overall, but not necessarily for the centers of flowers. So going back to the, um, la the uh, layers panel, I put a lip mask on top, layer, layer mask, hide all, and I'm going to get a small brush about the size of the center of the flowers, put them at 100% and go boom, 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 boom. Hey, Harold, could you yeah. zoom, zoom in on one of the flowers so we can, you sure. know, because it's a little far away there. Okay. No, but I was having such boom, fun boom. singing. You, you were. I didn't want to interrupt you. I heard you. <laughs> Okay, so there it is with it, there it is without it. And why don't I just finish bumping and then I'll, uh, then I'll uh, come back and take another look at them. Probably it's too much, I would say, by the way. But not a bad technique to use on something like this. I mean, there are so many techniques that involve this LAB color stuff. You could just spend like a, a lifetime on a single image. Okay, let me let me go uh, highlight one of them like this one, and here's without, and here's with, and I'm going to put it down to about halfway for reality. Okay, I think I think I've got enough. Um, what's the word, Moxie, for maybe one more image? Um, let me let me go see what would be fun. Any questions about this before I shut it down? Uh, Carm has a comment. Guess I was expecting local sharpening versus global. Well, that was kind of that was uh, local. Local in the sense of Harold was just painting in the sharpening using a um, layer mask, right? Into I mean, the I centers mean, of the I flower. Mean if, so, so let's let's go take a look at that mask again. Um, only the areas that are white on here were sharpened. Connect the dots, Harold. But yeah, so so what Harold does is he you know gets a duplicate layer, he puts it into lab, into LAB, and then he just sharpens the lightness layer, and then he goes back and using the layer mask, you know, so that does that entire layer does get sharpened, but then you use a layer mask, it hides it all. And then you go in with your brush and you just paint in the little spots that you want. Or, or so with, you're not doing the whole thing. Or with the star trails example at the beginning, it was just the star trails I used. I didn't use the brush. I used the gradient tool to, to the same effect. 
Right. And that's that way it's it's smoother, you know, for this big smooth swath instead of getting, you know, little lines. Yeah, but this is exactly local sharpening versus global sharpening. It's also something else, which is just lightness channel sharpening. Okay, let's see. All right, I will, I will show this one, but let me first point out that for the most part, I shoot uh, landscapes, exteriors and landscapes when I can in bracketed exposures. So here is the bracketed sequence that, that uh, created an image that when I combined the bracketed layers got to something like this. The actual combining of those layers is a little beyond the scope of this webinar, but let's suppose that I like what I've got here, but I want to deepen the colors just a little bit. Okay, and I'm going to refer to what I call my homeopathy theory of adjusting of, and filters, which is that the idea behind homeopathy, and no offense to anyone here who's a dedicated homeopathist, is that a little bit of a poison can cure you, whereas a lot of, uh, um, of it is um, deadly. So if you use any adjustment or any filter at 100% for the most part, whether it's Nix or Topazes or Unones or, or Aurora or whatever, it's pretty deadly, but at moderate percentages, it's they can be really nice. So I'm going to, first of all, duplicate this image. Image, duplicate, I just did, I duplicated it. And I'm gonna run my, oh, better, better remember, put it into LAB and run my action. Basically, however, the only thing I'm really going to be interested in here are the, is the B equalization and the A equalization and the L equalization for this image. And so let's pull them out. I'm going to shut. Hey, Harold. Yes. How did you know that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, this is a landscape demo, okay? And you know in landscapes, you don't want to get anything too bizarre fundamentally. So, you know, experience, how about that? I mean, you know, if you're going to invert a landscape, you're going to, you're going to get unnatural stuff. And if it ain't natural, well, I don't know. See, here's an, here's an L channel inversion of this landscape. I'll make it a little bigger. That doesn't really do any much for anything. But maybe one of, I mean, it looks actually a little bit like a colored in front version. Maybe uh, whoever it was who was, Norm, I think, who was asking me about that, this might be a place for you to start looking at uh, L channel inversions of imagery and how that goes with. Uh, but, but anyhow, it was, I, I'm intending to make something roughly realistic here. So I've saved the three adjustments I'm going to use here. And primarily, I'm going to use the B equalization. And let's make this guy a little bigger so we can see it a bit. Incidentally, this is a really beautiful place. It's Lembert Dome in the Sierra Nevada mountains above Tuolumne Meadows. It's about a two mile walk up the back to the top of this wonderful steep thing. I recommend it. So. Here comes the B equalization. And I put it in color blending mode. I put a layer mask on top, layer, layer mask, hide all. And yeah, you know, we're now we're gonna kind of have to just play with it and see what looks good. I was thinking the trees, the sky, and some of the clouds, but probably at not much more than about 30% opacity. And as Phyllis says, if I don't like it, I can take down the overall opacity of the layer easily enough. So let's go like that. Like that. 
Yeah, that actually looks pretty good. Um, so now I'm going to, let me just call it BEQ. Now I'm going to throw um, the A equalization over it. And my idea with the A equalization is to put a little more saturation into the trees and to brighten up that already pretty wonderful cloud strip on the left. Okay, and we'll put it in color blending mode. And we'll go layer, layer mask, hide all. So first I'll give a hit right here like that. And then I'll get my brush much smaller. Yeah, that's even so like about that. And I'll go, boom. that might be a little over the top. So let's, uh, let's um, take that down a bit in opacity, maybe like about that. And let me add a little bit over here too. Boom. Nice sunset, wasn't it? All right, fellas. And then I'm going to add add the L equalization as with Kirsten. I'm going to put it at, into soft light blending mode at between eight and ten percent. It helps almost every image. It's not there's no. Okay. So here we have it. Here's a nice, a nice, beautiful sunset. Wasn't bad when it started. Added a bit of yellow and blue and with a mask. Added a bit of radiant red to the sky and added a bit of contrast via soft light and the uh, L EQ blending mode, all of it without without uh, um, trying to go too much over the top to being careful about that. I would like at this point to throw us open to any questions, answers, comments, fun, and please uh, please send some JPEGs if you're working along. That would be great. Yeah, I do a save all all the time. I haven't shown that in my workflow here. Lane, a good question indeed. Uh, I, I would do a save all in terms of workflow. When I'm at this point, I would go save all, save or save as. And I, I, uh, I, I tend to uh, do a sequence I can follow of my saving. So I would call this something like lembertdome.a then I would, I'm not actually going to do it here, but that's what I would do. And then I would um, layer it down and say, and do a save as and call it dot B. Yes, of course, I will uh, show before and after. Here's, here's where it started. Here's where it ended. Claire, is that uh, clear enough? And also Karen uh, says it may be a very basic question, but what are you using to copy or move the layers onto the original photo? Yes, uh, two, two techniques were demonstrated in here. Um, it may be a basic question, but it's a good one to ask. We certainly get a lot of email about it. If you have a source and a target, let's say that um, this image here is the target and let's say I'm going to move another copy of B equalization onto it. So B is the source, this guy's the target. I go select all, edit, copy. Then I go to the target and I go edit, paste, okay? That's one method. Another method is to make sure the move tool is selected. Um, let's see, I'm gonna deselect, make sure the move tool is selected, hold down the shift key, click on the source, drag it over to the target, let go of the mouse, let go of the shift key. Well, I didn't quite get it that time, but that happens. If I let go too fast here, we'll do it again. 
Well, that, that's actually a good example, Harold, because if you let the uh, shift key go before you release the mouse, then it will do that. It won't um, line up exactly. So you have to make sure you get it exact, you know, pull it over, release the mouse button, and then let go of the shift key. And then that's why I show the other method of a select all, edit, copy, edit, paste, because that's basically foolproof. Whereas the, whereas the mouse stuff takes dexterity that sometime after talking for two hours straight, I no longer completely have. The cow person That's, version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a joke. <laughs> Thanks everyone for being such a great uh, webinar audience. And I look forward to seeing serendipitous LAB um, images flowing out like, uh, like the great rivers of the world. And uh, I, I do, I do really look forward to hearing from everyone for sure. Thanks, thanks a lot for spending your uh, morning or afternoon with us. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.